hopefully that's all I need to do. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So today we're going to talk about configuring ArcGIS for bus stop ADA compliance surveying and monitoring. So I'm gonna do kind of a quick demo and then we're gonna actually kind of dive into the configuration of what I did, um, hopefully giving you the tools that you could deploy this yourself. But before we do that, I'm gonna do a little did you know. So here's just some facts about public transit that I found today. So um, a lot of people use transit. Um, 35 million boardings happen each weekday. It's a $68 billion industry and employs 420,000 people. So we're talking about a huge, uh, huge industry here. Uh, something that I thought was interesting is you can reduce your chances of being in an automobile accident by more than 90% by taking transit instead of using your own personal vehicle. And there are more than 7,700 organizations that provide public transportation. So huge industry. And um, because of that, my PowerPoint will work. We now have a public transit team. So uh, this is something new that Desiree started this year, but uh, we, we have a team that's solely focused um, to the needs and, and kind of the technology um, around public transportation. So who is the team? So um, I'm, I'm one half of the team. Right now it's a team of two. I'm a solution engineer. Um, just some fun facts about me. I've been to more than half of the Major League Baseball ballparks out there. Hope to get to the rest of them. Um, I'm a Cardinals fan and a Broncos fan, so both are doing well right now. Pretty happy about that. I like camping and hiking with my pugs, and you can see them here. That's, uh, this is Mr. Tots, and that's Nettie. Go on a lot of little trips. And my favorite part about this job is working with cutting-edge technology and helping users be successful. So um, and that's really kind of part of what we're doing here today is I, I want to uh, kind of do some outreach here and hopefully provide some good, uh, good information. So Shayla Martin is the other half of our team. I'm going to let her unmute herself and she can introduce herself here. Shayla, are you on? Hello, everyone. Yes. And so Jay's got the photo of Wiley there. I'm a self-proclaimed crazy cat lady and one of the last uh, Cleveland Browns fans. Yes, I am probably an Ohio State fan as well. I grew up in Ohio and uh, Jay and I are both now here in Colorado. So love living out here and have traveled to meet quite a few of you who are on the line and Look forward to talking to some of you who are kind of new to our public transit team. So welcome and thanks for joining us today. And did you notice the little smiley face up next to the Ohio State thing? <laughs> yes, thanks for that. Time. Appreciate it. <laughs> and Shayla does play gold glove defense for our softball team. She's an excellent third baseman. So oh, thank you, Jay. That out as well. we have a thanks for team. pointing that out. <laughs> Okay, so what are we doing here today? What, what is this webcast all about? So uh, really what we're trying to do, we're going to post these quarterly, but um, just trying to build up the transit provider user community. It's just kind of a way to bring us all together. Uh, Shayla and I have met with a lot of different folks at a lot of different agencies, and we kind of hear that, um, you know, we're all kind of segregated. Uh, we, we don't really uh, talk a whole lot to other agencies, so we thought this could be a way to kind of bring everyone together. It's also be a great way to learn about new technology. Um, and deploying that technology to solve real business problems. So the format for this is really informal. Um, if there's any questions or anything that pop up as we're going along here, you can go ahead and type those into the chat window and I'll look at that at the end of um, the presentation and we'll get those answered. Um, I can also kind of open, open this up to discussion at the end as well too. Um, I also say this is informal so that when I mess up, I can just say, hey, this is informal, don't worry about it. We are going to record all of these webcasts, so we'll make those available. So if you missed it, or uh, if you wanna go back and see something that I did, you can always go back and look at that. Um, we're gonna make all of these um, recordings available on a story map. So the link to that story map was in the invitation that I sent out. Uh, here is the bit.ly link for that though, if you wanna snap a photo or take a screenshot of that real quick, and of course we can share that out afterwards as well. So we're gonna start off with a demonstration. So we're gonna start with a demonstration. We're gonna look at a few different pieces of technology here and see how these interact together to help solve a problem. Before I jump into this though, um, I really want to thank Phoenix Valley Metro. They, they provided the survey that, I use, that I'm gonna be using here. I've modified it a little bit, but they were the original creator of this. Um, so Ben Davidson, if you're on the phone, uh, thank you very much. And actually this photo here is from 2017, they were a SAG award winner, which is the Screen Actors Guild. Actually, it's Special Achievement in GIS. 
Um, and then uh, this is Corey and uh, I believe that's Joe. Uh, Corey's no longer with Valley. He moved on to the, the state, I believe. Um, but they've been doing some really great work and uh, they received an award that uh, really recognizes that. But I do want to thank that whole organization for providing, providing us with this form and giving us permission to distribute it. So when we're finished here today, I can give you access to this form. And when you see how complicated the configuration of this is, you'll want to thank them too, because they may end up saving you a lot of time. So let's jump into the demonstration. So this is kind of setting up uh, what we're going to be doing here today. Um, so we have kind of a scenario, and the scenario is based kind of loosely on a business problem that we've heard from a number of different agencies. So uh, we all have to go out and check whether or not our bus stops are ADA compliant. We have a limited budget, so we're setting a modest goal, we're trying to get X amount ADA compliant, we'll call it 80% here. Um, given the scope of this huge project, we want to prioritize the stops that are likely to serve the highest number of passengers, especially ADA passengers. Um, as a good steward of public funding, we want to be transparent, keep the taxpayers informed, and let them know that we're trying to improve mobility for everyone. So we're kind of facing, I see it as five different issues. So we're having trouble assigning and coordinating our field work. So there's a lot of bus stops we have to go out and check. How do we coordinate that? Um, this, our stop assessment is usually done with paper forms. That leads to a lot of different issues. The paper could get lost. We have to come back in the office and enter that information. There's really no standardization of, of how we're entering this information. Uh, we have a hard time monitoring the progress and keeping stakeholders informed. And that could be internal stakeholders. So, you know, our management wants to be aware of what's going on, or maybe we need to keep engineering aware because they're going to go out and fix the bus stops. But just being able to break down those silos internally, but also externally as well. Uh, we're also having a hard time identifying stops that should be the highest priority, and we don't have a great mechanism to keep the uh, public informed and also solicit feedback from the public. So today, we're going to focus on these three problems, kind of the, the field part of this problem. We do have some great solutions that tackle these last two, um, particularly we could work with um, our desktop products or our community analysts online to kind of come up with a prioritization of which bus stops we should fix. There's some really great tools for engaging the public, whether that be story maps or survey one, two, three, or other uh, crowdsourcing mechanisms. But for today, let's focus on these three problems here. So I'm gonna switch over here. I'm gonna exit this. And let's start off in workforce. So this is workforce for ArcGIS. This is included with ArcGIS Online. Um, in fact, everything that I'm showing you today is included with ArcGIS Online subscription. So uh, many of you have ArcGIS Online. If you're current on desktop maintenance, you do have access to ArcGIS Online. So you should be able to do everything that I'm showing you here today. So this is part of ArcGIS Online. And we can see here, we have over 9,000 stops in our system. This is our, our fake Esri system that looks a lot like Denver, which is where I'm at. And how do we coordinate the work that we need to do here? So we have to send people out. We need to be able to, to assess these stops. So the first thing this does is this tells me who's, who's available to work. So this shows right here that Jason is working. And Shayla always likes when I point out that she is not working. Um, but this is giving me real-time information about, at the very least, who's logged into their workforce app out in the field. I can click over here, and I can see what... Um, assignments have been assigned and I can see here that we've had two assignments assigned but they've already been completed so let's go ahead and make some new assignments here I'm gonna zoom in on the map and we can see here this is where my field worker is at so I'm getting real-time information my field worker is actually in the office I can see imagine that and let's grab a couple of bus stops to assign so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab this tool here and let's just select a few of these stops We'll select all of these, I can look at it, I can verify that I have the right stops, and I'm going to create assignments. So this is gonna ask me a few different things. So what type of assignment is this? So we're gonna send somebody out to do an inspection. We have the locations for each one of these. I can decide who to assign it to, so I can see who's available to work, and also um, how far away they are. So if more people were logged in, I could assign these to whoever's closest, if that makes the most sense. So I'll assign these to Jason, I can give these a priority, a due date, and a time. 
Um, if I have some type of work order management system, I could optionally include a work order ID. So I'll just type in a number here. I could provide some notes here. So I could say, select um, bus stops for ADA compliance. And I could even include some attachments for the field worker to use. Um, so I could select a file and let's just grab, let's see, put this diagram in there and we can create these assignments now. Now, once these assignments are created, the field worker is gonna see this on the field worker app. So let's take a look at that. So now I'm gonna be switching roles and I'm gonna bring over my iPad here. So now I'm switching roles, I'm the role of Jason. And what did I do with my iPad? So Jay assigned these, Jason is gonna do the field work. So let's take a look at the field app now. And I'm going to open Workforce. And I'm gonna see all of the work orders that were created for me from my dispatcher. So here I can see I have four inspections that I need to do. I could sort these a number of different ways. So I could sort these by priority, or in this case, maybe I wanna do it by distance. So I'll do the one that's closest to me first. So let's grab this guy here. And I can take a look at this. And the first thing I want to do is I want to start the work. So I've now started my assignment. Now in the background, if you pay attention here, this should update um, pretty much any second now. Sometimes there's a little bit of lag based on internet. Okay, so now we can see. So in the back here, we can see the dispatcher is seeing that this work has started. It's now in progress. So let's go back to the field worker now on the iPad. I can see the notes, I can view that attachment if I need to, I could download that if I wanted to take a look at that, but we won't do that. So let's start our work now. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna click this button. I'm given a couple of options. Now if I have Navigator for ArcGIS, I could use that to give me turn-by-turn -turn directions to this assignment. Um, Navigator is a great tool, it works in a disconnected environment. You can upload your own streets. So if there's private roads, things like that that you maintain that are part of the typical road network, you can um, load that there as well. Navigator is not included with RTS Online, it is an add-on, so I do want to point out this is the only thing that uh, will be seen today that is included. But in this click case, I'm going to use Explorer, and Explorer is included, it's just another app. So I'm going to explore the assignment. This launches Explorer for me, and it's going to show the stops that I need to inspect here. So let's pick one of these. And I could look at the information here, and I'm just looking at the screen now. So I'm seeing the stop name, the stop ID. I could verify that. If I wanted to, I could get turn by turn directions through uh, Navigator again, or I could use the default mapping system of, of my device. In this case, it's Apple Maps. Uh, but in this case, I'm at the location now. Let's launch Survey123 and collect the data. So I'm going to click the link here. And this opens Survey123. So this is the actual. Uh, survey that we're going to be using to collect all our information about ADA compliance. So let's take a look at this. A few things have happened here. So um, at the top here, it is logging my location. It automatically grabbed the bus stop ID from Explorer. So the previous app we were in, when I launched that, there was a bus stop ID associated with that feature. I passed that through to Survey123. When I did that, I was able to call on a different um, file and populate this information here. So this pop, this information didn't come from Explorer, this came from a, a record as part of Survey123. So I'm getting the stop name, the stop direction, the stop location, and the, the bus route that it serves. So I can uh, configure Survey123 to help automate my data collection process, which is really big when you're out in the field. You don't want to be typing a whole lot of things on an iPad. So let's start collecting some information. So the first question it's asking me, is there a bus stop pad? So I'll say yes. And you can see here I get a photo. So this is giving, some, giving me some clue as to how I'm supposed to measure uh, these dimensions and the slope and so forth. So you can provide that information to folks in the field so they know exactly what they should be doing. So let's enter some information. Is the pad more than eight by five? We'll say yes. We'll enter some slope information that we've collected. So we'll just put in some numbers here. So we'll say these are the percentages. Is there a shelter? We'll say no. 
the accessible route, so that'd be the sidewalk. Does the sidewalk meet these requirements? We'll put on the slope for this as well. We'll put in the stop length. So this would be all information that we'd be measuring. And is there a bus stop sign? We'll say no, the bus stop sign's missing. So you can see right here, it's telling me at the end of this, it's doing a calculation in the background and it's telling me that this stop does not meet ADA requirements. Not only is it telling me that, it's telling me why. In this case, it's missing a sign. If the sign were there, I could hit yes, and it gets rid of that. Now this stop meets ADA requirements. So this is really a truly a smart form. It's not only collecting information, but it's doing some calculations in the background. We can also collect some other information while we're out in the field. So how many benches, bike racks, trash cans we have. So while we're out there, we might as well collect that information. We can also collect images. So let's take a picture here. And there happens to be a bus stop right here. So we have our image, and when we're finished, we're collecting our information, let's log the date, click the checkbox, and it gives me a few options now. So this works in a disconnected environment. So if I don't have um, some type of a data connection, I could actually just store this on my device and send it later, or I could go back to the survey and fill it out, make some okay, changes, so we'll or in this that. case, let's just send it now. Oh, we have a connection, okay, that's send finished. So now we can go back to workforce. Um, I can add a note here if I need to send information back to the office. And I am now finished with this one, so I'll click finished. And then I could go back onto my list and go from there. Now, if you notice in the background, when I did that, it completed that assignment. I can see, oh, looking at the wrong one here. So completed that one, and we can see the note from the person in the field. So it's providing that two-way communication in real time, giving you that true Actual awareness. Did you hear that? My phone thought I said something to it. It's weird. Okay, so that kind of tackles our first two problems. Uh, we have a way to coordinate the field work, and now we also have a way to collect the, the information and kind of store it in a centralized way. The other thing that we wanted to tackle today is providing that operational awareness. So for that, we can use the operations dashboard. So this is a configurable dashboard. This is part of RTIS Online or Enterprise, again, um, so you should have access to this as long as you have access to online or enterprise. Um, but this is based around a web map. So we're pulling in that information um, that we've been collecting out in the field. And I can view this here. And this information will be streaming in in real time. Um, so I can configure a number of different widgets that give me that operational awareness. So we've set a goal of 80% or more ADA compliant. Right now we can see that of the few stops that we've surveyed, we've only surveyed five, 40% uh, of those are ADA compliant. I can also configure these to be uh, dependent upon the map view. So if I were to zoom in, for example, we can see how this changes based on the stop. So here we only have three stops, two of the three aren't compliant. Here we can see 100% are compliant. Um, so there's a number of ways I can configure this to get that real-time information. I'm, I can see who's doing the surveys. So I can see a list here, who's completed these surveys. And then something else that we built into the survey, um, in the background, it knows when you open the survey and it knows when you close the survey. So it's doing a calculation in the background about how long it's taking you to do a survey. So we can also monitor how long it takes to do a survey. Uh, we can compare you know, different locations, different field workers, and just see how long it's taking them to do the work. Here we have a widget. This is just looking at the information that we're collecting in the field. So this is all the information coming from that survey. Uh, let's look at a different one. If there is a photo, you'll see the photo here. I'm not sure why I'm not seeing the photos, but we do have photos on some of these. I'm picking the wrong one. 
Oh, here we go. So this was one that I did yesterday. Uh, we can see the photo as well. So we have all that information, everything we're collecting, we have at our fingertips here. And then I've also configured some widgets to keep track of the cost. So that's gonna be a big thing here is we need to upgrade these stops. How much is it gonna cost us to do this? So uh, for example, we know we have three stops that have pad compliance issues and we could just do some math in the background. We know it costs, we'll call it $1,500 to fix a pad. So we can keep a running total of how much it's gonna to cost to fix those stops. So we have this information right here at our fingertips. Again, we could configure these to have that um, map extent view as well. I didn't do that for these ones, but uh, we could have this so that when we zoom in, uh, these numbers would change based on the particular view that we're looking at as well. So that kind of tackles the first three issues that we had set out initially. So uh, being able to assign workers to the field, being able to collect data in a streamlined way, and then being able to share that information and have that operational awareness. So now that we've done that, um, let's, let's kind of dive in a little bit deep here. So we're gonna kind of get into the nuts and bolts of how this was configured. So everything that I've done here is using a configurable application that's available through ArcGIS. Um, this requires absolutely no uh, coding to do any of this. Um, I'm not a programmer by any stretch of the imagination, but I am able to configure all of these applications and have them interact with each other and work together. So how, how do we do this? So let's take a step back again and let's look at a different screen here. Okay, so we used a few different applications here. We used Workforce to assign field work. We used Explorer uh, to be able to look at a map, figure out which stop we wanted to go to. From Explorer, we launched Survey123 to actually collect the data, and we used Operations Dashboard to have that real-time awareness. So how do we configure each one of these? I'm gonna do these a little bit out of order because they're dependent on each other. So I'm actually going to uh, start here with Survey123. So I'm gonna start at the Survey123 page. I'm just gonna give you kind of an overview of how these apps are configured. We're not gonna go through everything um, to get it to where I did today. That would probably take a little bit more time than we have, but I wanna give you the tools you need uh, to be able to do this. And I think when I'm finished, I might write up a little post um, about the step-by-step -step instructions so that you can actually do everything that I did today. So I am in Survey123. I am logged into my ArcGIS Online account and I can look at the surveys that I've created. So here's all of the surveys that I've created. Here's the survey that we use today. Um, but I'm going to create a new survey. So if I wanted to start from scratch, how would I do this? So you're given two options whenever you click on this. You can use the web designer, and this is very simple to use. It open, you can build a survey within a browser. Um, this is best for simple surveys though. So you can't do a lot of that logic that we saw in the demonstration. So doing that calculation of is this ADA compliant or not? Or you may have noticed that um, some of those questions, depending on whether I said yes or no, it posed other questions. So having those dependencies. Is there a pad? Yes. And then it asked me questions about the pad. Um, auto filling out some of the information about the bus stop. You can't do that in the web designer. However, you can build a nice survey uh, really quickly with the web designer. To do the more complex surveys, you would use Survey123 Connect, and that's software that you can download. Uh, the download's free to use. Uh, you just log in with your RTS Online or Enterprise account to be able to share that survey. Um, but the way that it's built is through what's called an XLS form spreadsheet. Basically, you build these out in Excel. Let's take a look at uh, how that works. So I'm gonna open Survey123 Connect. And this is where you build the more complex surveys. And this is where I'll show you um, what it took to build the ADA compliance survey that the Valley Metro shared and show you why we should all be so happy that they're willing to share that with us. So here I can see some other surveys that I've built, um, but we could start with a new survey. So let's click that, and I'm given a few different options. So you're given templates. 
Uh, typically, you would use the advanced. If you're going to use the basic, you might as well just use the web builder, I would say. There's also samples available so uh, that show you how to use different features. So if you need a barcode scanner, for example, in your survey, use this, and this will show you how to create a barcode scanner question. So you can scan a barcode and call information into your survey. Some really cool things you can do with survey one, two, three. Uh, let's just go to the templates though. Let's go to advanced. And I'll probably give this a title. And create a survey. So this launches the builder and it opens Excel for us. So this shows us what the survey is gonna look like in real time. And let me pull this over, let's open on a different screen. And here is the what's called XLS form. It's a spreadsheet for building out this particular uh, survey. So how would we build this out? So here we can see the first question we had, they just put one in here by default so you can see how it works. So type, name, and label are the three fields we always fill out. So type is the type of information you're collecting. And there's a lot of different things we can collect here. Integers, decimals, uh, select from a list, select multiple, geopoint, that's a map, date, time, a lot of different things we can do here. Um, name, so this is what is gonna, uh, this creates the field in the database where the data is gonna be stored. So anything that's uh, collected in this question here is going to be stored under the example field in our database. And then label is how the question is posed on the form. So you can almost think of this like it as a, a field alias almost. Uh, so if you're, if you're doing, used to using desktop, um, databases, things like that, think of this as your, your alias field. So we can see now, just looking at this, here's how this looks. Example is the question that's being posed, that comes from here. This is a text field, so I can type into it, and this is anything that gets entered here is gonna be stored in the example field, if that makes sense. So if we wanted to add to this, uh, we could do a select one, for example. So we wanna have a selection, now it's asking me for a list name. Where does that list come from? That comes from our choices tab down here. So here's a few lists that come by default with the form, or you could add in your own list. So we could do something like, let's do surveyor. We'll have two choices. So again, this works in the same way. Name is what would get logged in the actual database. A label is what you would see in the survey. Let's do a different name, that might be useful. So now we have two choices here. So select one, and then what list are we gonna use? We'll use that surveyor list. our question and now when we save this this is going to update the form and we can see what this looks like in real time so here I can see who is the surveyor Shaler J it's a pick one can't pick multiple so you can just continue to kind of fill these out in that way um, so you can kind of see these are the basics here there's a lot of other fields here though so we could provide a question hint um, we can provide a constraint, so a range, for example. If this is a numerical question, for example, and um, you know, it needs between zero and 50, we could provide that constraint and also a message for that. Um, is the question required? So if it's yes, they can't move forward without um, submitting the answer. Um, how does the question appear? So the number of different options based on the type of question that it is. Is there a default answer? Is this a read-only? Uh, calculations, so this is where you can kind of build in, um, you know, the ADA compliance, yes or no, things like that. You can fill all this up. So to do that, it would take a lot of time. Um, I'm going to provide you guys with the resources, though, afterwards so that you can really dive in on this. But in the, uh, for the sake of time, 
let's take a look at the survey that we use today. So I'm gonna close this guy and let's look at this. So this is the survey that we use today. And you can see here, there's a lot going on here. Um, I think Valley spent a good amount of time to configure this and get this right. I, I made a few tweaks to it. I eliminated a few questions that were specific to Phoenix, added in a few things. Um, but we can just kind of take a look at this here so you can get a feel for what it takes to, to create this type of a survey. So the first thing is the geo point. That was the map that we had at the top. Pull this guy back over. So that's the location here. That's that first question. Uh, bus stop ID is the next question here. And we were po auto populating that from Explorer, but we still have to add that as a question here. And then all of these here, we had these set to auto fill. So these aren't really questions, these are notes. And these notes are populated. How are these notes populated? Let's look at the configuration for these guys. So if we scroll over here, in the calculation box, we're using a pull data function. Um, and there's a blog post that talks about pull data. But what pull data does is it looks at a CSV file that you have loaded with your survey123. It's looking for um, information from a different question in a survey, and it's basically doing um, a join to bring in information. So in this case, uh, we're pulling data from the bus stop CSV, which I've loaded previously. Uh, we're pulling information from stop name. We're looking for the stop ID, and uh, in this case, I'm populating, I'm sorry, I'm filling out the stop name that's coming from the stop ID, and I get the stop ID from this question here. And that's probably a little bit confusing. Uh, the blog post actually does a better job of explaining that. I'll be sure to provide that. There's also some really great videos on YouTube that the Survey123 team puts out for configuring these. Um, but I just kind of want to give you a feel for uh, some of the st things that we can do here, for example. Um, Groups, so we can group questions together. So this is the bus stop ADA survey. We can see that this is a group, and we know it's a group because if I were to come here, I can open and close that group. So you see I did that. That's what a grouping questions does. So I could fold all those up. It's just a nice way to organize some of these questions. Um, doing that, you can also have, let's look at, is there a pad? Yes, there is a pad. Is the pad ADA compliant? What are the dimensions of the pad? So we're only gonna get this question if there is a pad. So here we put in a relevant statement. So we're saying only ask us this question if the answer to pad, this guy here, is there a pad, equals yes. So that's where you build in those dependencies. So we don't get that question if we answer no to the pad because there's nothing to measure. Um, here's, these are doing the calculations to determine whether or not um, it's ADA compliant. So for example, this is looking at the slope. If I enter something above 2.6, it's a no. If it's less than 2.6, it's a yes for the ADA compliancy. We don't actually see that question on the form. This is doing that calculation in the background. And it's looking at all of these calculations to determine whether or not the stop is compliant. Okay, so that's probably enough with Survey123. Uh, I definitely will provide some more resources for that though so that you can kind of dive on this on your own. Um, and then as I said, Bally said we are free to share this, so I'll, I'll share this form out as well. Um, so you could download this, you're free to hack away at it, change it, do whatever you want to it. Then I think just kind of playing with it and navigating with it uh, will give you a feel for, for how to configure some of these questions. Okay, so we have our survey one, two, three form ready. Uh, the other component that we needed, so, so when I finish that, um, all I would need to do here is verify that I'm signed in, so I am already signed in, um, and then all I have to do here is hit publish, and that creates a survey for me. Once that's been published, I can then download that. So let's leave this here. 
Oops, I'll go back to survey one, two, three. Uh, let's see, let's go back. If I come here, I can click download surveys at the very top. And this shows me surveys that I have available to me. I can download it to my device. The reason you're downloading the survey is because this works in a disconnected environment. It's also bringing in all of that media. So if there's photos, like we had the photo of the uh, bus stop diagram in there, um, it's also bringing in the spreadsheet in the background that is doing that calculation of, of the bus stop name and location. All of that information is, is going to be stored on your device. So that's the survey one, two, three component. How do we use Explorer? So actually, let's just look at Explorer real quick. So Explorer, this is a, a free app you can download and use. Um, but all this is using is a web map. So here we're looking at the, the stops. Um, you might notice that the stops are ridiculously big. The reason I did that is because they're a lot easier to uh, click on or, or push with your finger in, in, in a mobile app like this. So it's actually relevant to the size of the symbol itself. So anytime I'm making a field data collection map like this, I usually make the symbols ridiculously big. Um, so when I click on one of these, it's showing me the stop. Um, it's giving me a little pop-up here, so it's telling me the name, stop ID, and it's giving me a link to launch survey123. How do we configure this? This is actually really simple. The only thing we need to do for this is create a web map. So let's do that. So I'm logged into ArcGIS Online here. I'm going to go to my, my map viewer here. And we're going to add a layer. So in this case, I want to add my bus stops layer. So I can search for layers. I've already made bus stops available to me here. So let's just do a search for stops. And I'm going to add the bus stops. And there's just a few things that I need to do to this layer to get it ready for the field data work. So we're actually not editing any data with this. We're just using this as kind of a reference layer for the field worker. So let's look at the pop-up. So it's using the default pop-up here. It's bringing in the FID, the bus stop ID, and the stop name. So FID is not relevant. This is just the system generated ID. It has nothing to do with anything about that stop. There's no need to see that. But in this case, if you remember, we also had that link in there to launch survey one, two, three. So for that, we're gonna have to create a custom pop-up. So how would we do that? So let's go to our content here. Here is our stops layer. So I can, first off, I could just rename this. Bus stops. And let's go to configure pop-up. And what I wanna do here, so by default, it has a list of the attribute table. We want a custom attribute display. So let's configure this. So there's a lot of things I could do here as far as customizing this. You could have photos, hyperlinks, all kinds of things in here. Um, but we want the bus stop ID. We want the stop name. And let's just look at that. So click OK, OK, let's test it. So here I'm getting the bus stop ID, the bus stop name. Uh, a lot of things you could do to format this and clean this up, but let's go back now, let's configure. Now we wanna add that hyperlink. So we're back to oh, uh, configure attributes, configure this. And we're gonna add a hyperlink in here. Launch survey one, two, three. What is the URL that I need to put in for this? So there is documentation on our website that talks about linking and integrating Survey123 into other apps. Um, there's a lot of information here, but basically to call Survey123, this is the link that you use. This launches the app, and then the item ID, this guy here, tells it which survey to open. So how do you know what your survey ID is? Let's go back to Survey123 here. Let's pick the survey that we want. This number right here, that's your survey ID. So that's where you know where to get that. So all you would have to do is copy that and put that in for this. That would launch survey one, two, three. 
and open the particular survey that you're trying to open. Now we did a couple of other things though. I auto-populated the bus stop ID. So to do that, you add this. So we put the, the and symbol and you tell it the uh, field name and what you want it to populate with. And then there was one other thing that I did because I have to cheat during this demo. I'm not actually out in the field. I pass in the latitude and longitude from the bus stop itself so that whenever I open survey one, two, three, it looks like I'm at that location. Now, if you're actually collecting data in the field, you probably wouldn't have to include this particular part of the URL because it's going to use your location services. But since I can't do that in this demo, I pass that through as well. So what does that look like? Here's what it looks like for our, uh, for our survey. So this opens survey one, two, three. Here's my item ID. This came from here. Um, we want to populate stop ID input. That's the name of the field in survey one, two, three. We want to populate that with the BS ID. So that's pulling from the database. And then I'm going to do the um, center. So I'm passing in the latitude and longitude, um, which is a field that's in the, the, the bus stop data as well. So we can just take this, copy it, and let's go back here. We'll highlight this, put in our URL for the hyperlink, set that, click OK, click OK. And I have survey123 on my computer. Let's see if this works. So we'll launch survey, open survey123. Did it open the other screen? It's actually opening on the other screen. Once it comes up, I'll bring it over. Here we go. So I grabbed the bus stop ID. That was a complete accident, but I grabbed J Road, which is kind of cool, and um, auto populated this information. So our, our link works there. So we're good with this. Um, the other thing I want to do, though, is I want to um, make these symbols ridiculously big again. So let's go to our symbol properties. Um, let's just grab a circle. Oh, hold on, that's not what I wanted to do. We'll change the fill. We'll make it gray. Give it a black outline. I want some transparency. And then we'll make this something silly like 70. Click OK. And maybe not quite that big. Let's do 50. Click OK, we're done. I'm going to save this. So we'll save it, give it a name, tags. So these are kind of key terms that somebody might search for in order to find this map. We'll save it. And then we can share this. So I can share this um, with a particular group. So I can create groups within ArcGIS Online and only those folks in that group would have access to this. I could share it with my whole organization. So anyone can log in to my organization has access. Or I can make this publicly available. So anyone in the public that has access to this URL can then open this map. I'm just going to share it with some groups here. I'm going to share it with my assessment groups. I'll say that I'm done. It's warning me that, okay, you're sharing the map, but you also have this layer in here, the stops layer. You're going to have to share that as well. Are you cool with that? So we'll say update sharing. We're fine with that. And we're finished. So now let's go back here and let's give this a shot. So we'll go to our ADA assessment. Here we see the webinar map. This is what we just created. I can open this. Click on any of the stops. I have my launch survey one, two, three. Open survey one, two, three for me. And it's grabbing that bus stop ID and some other things for me.
So we were able to get that to work as well. And so now that we've done that, um, next thing we want to do is configure workforce. So that's how we are going to be able to assign field workers to go out and, and do this work. So from ArcGIS Online, um, you should have this little uh, grid thing here that these are different apps you can launch. Let's launch Workforce. And this is showing me projects that I have available, but let's create a project. Call this the webinar project. We'll create our project. And then this is pretty simple to configure. takes just a, about a minute here to pull everything together because it's gonna look for users we have available, different web maps that we have available, and it's putting together some other feature services in the background for this project. So because we can do things like track the workers, do breadcrumbing, things like that. All right, so here is the setup of this. So we have a few steps we have to do. The first thing we have to do is add assignment types. So what type of assignments can we have? So we'll say maybe a Surveying, and we'll say construction and costing. Next step is who are the users? So I'm creating this right now. So I'm a dispatcher by default. Dispatcher is the person using the browser here and creating the work orders. So let's pick some other people. So this is my other user. And I can assign this person as a dispatcher or a mobile worker. We'll add Shayla as well, the mobile worker. And you can continue to add other dispatchers and so forth. Let's look at some, look at some of the advanced settings here. So here's the app integration. So if you remember, whenever we were in the field and we were using Workforce, it launched um, Explorer for us. So we can add that integration here. So we want to add the integration to Explorer and it's asking us which map we want to have Explorer open. We named that webinar. So we'll launch the webinar map with Explorer. Who needs access to this map? So you can say no matter what the project type is, it opens, it opens that Explorer map. Or you can say it's actually only relevant when they're doing ADA surveying, so only that type has access to that. We'll finish there. And let's look at our overview. The two other things we can change here is we can set up specific maps for the dispatcher and the worker. So the dispatcher probably wants a map of where the bus stops are, so we'll just create that real quick. Search for layers. We'll create the a bus stop map. And again, we could do all the things here to configure the pop-ups nicely and make this look great. Um, but for sake of time, we'll just go with this guy. We'll save it. And now we are finished. So we can open this now and we can see what we've got. Okay, so here's our map. There's no assignments created. Here's the workers we've added. Let's create an assignment. We'll do uh, surveying, assign it to myself, priority, etc. Add in all that information. Let's see some, some of the stuff you do have to add. Um, so we could select a bus stop again, or you can just click on the map for a location and we'll create that assignment. And now that field worker, so let's look at that. Let's pull this guy back over, see how that worked. Let's close some things here. Let's open workforce. And here I can see, see the thing that's been assigned to me and this will launch Explorer for me. So we're seeing how that integration works now. There's actually no bus stops over here. That's a great spot. And then we saw how, if we click on this, it launches survey one, two, three. So now we have that, that good integration there. So that's kind of the, the field work 
flow piece of this. Now let's look at the operations dashboard quickly here. So let's close a few of these tabs. So here I'm back in ArcGIS Online and I have uh, my apps button here and we can open operations dashboard. And this is gonna ask me to sign in. So I'm logged in. Here are dashboards that I've already configured and that I have ready. I'm going to create a dashboard. And let's just build one of these real quick. We'll call it webinar. A dashboard. And let's just quickly show how we can build one of these. So there's a lot of things you can do here. First thing we want to do, we're going to add a map. This is all based on maps. And we've I've already created a web map. Um, what type of functionality do we want for our web maps? You can always come back and change this, but um, what are the settings, etc. And we bring in a web map. So this web map is just pulling in information from our ADA survey. Really simple to create a web map, but just build a web map, add that in here. So now we have a web map and the underlying data with it. Now we need to add a few um, widgets. So how do we configure these widgets? I'm going to show you how to configure a couple of these. As you can see here, there's a lot of things you can do. A list, a gauge, indicator, pie chart. Depends on the type of data you have in here, what makes sense. But I just want to show you how we could do just a couple that we had in our dashboard. So I'll start with an indicator. And this is how I did the cost widget, the thing that was keeping track of how much things cost. So if I had more than one layer here, I'd have to pick this, but um, there's only one layer. Right now it's just going with the default, saying there's six features in this particular um, map. We need to apply a filter though, because we don't care about all features. Let's do one for the pad compliancy. So this might be a little bit confusing, but there's a few different questions here that determine whether or not a pad is ADA compliant. So the first, is there a pad? And then it does a calculation of if it's no, it's not compliant. If it's yes, it is compliant. There's the, the excuse me, the dimensions, the slope measurements. So we have to add a filter for all of these. So let's go through and add these real quickly here. So we'll say pad ADA equals no. Or pad dimension ADA equals no, or pad slope one equals no, or and there's I think there's maybe six of these <laughs> pad slope two ADA because there's a lot of measurements you take equals no. Good thing is you only have to do this once. Slope, cross slope ADA is no, and cross slope two. So these are all ors, because if any one of these conditions isn't met, it's not ADA compliant. So pad cross slope two ADA, no. Okay. And so we've done that. Um, so this is telling us that we have three that aren't ADA compliant. We're gonna do a value conversion though, and I'm gonna do a factor. And this is where I put in the cost. So I'm just assuming we'll say it costs $1,500 to fix, to fix that. So for those three, it costs $4,500. And then to make this look a little bit better, we'll throw a dollar sign in front. Some text. And there's a lot of things you can do to change, you know, you can change the color, uh, the size, a lot of things you can do with these widgets, but we'll say that we're done. And now I have my first widget. And I can move these guys around, dock them wherever I want, however I want to configure this. But you can always move these around, you can stack them. Let's add one more just so we can see. I'm gonna do a gauge. And we'll look at, we'll do another filter here. And 
And let's look for, so ADA, yes. This tells me whether or not the stop is ADA compliant. Doesn't matter if it's a pad or a sidewalk or whatever. And we'll say no. So that drops us down to three. So three are not compliant. And then for our max value, we're gonna use a statistic and we'll just use the survey layer. So you can type in a value here or you can just say based on how many features. So three out of six aren't compliant. And that could change the way this looks. But I could also add in a threshold. And so I want the look of this to change when it hits, what did I do there? When it hits, we'll say 80%. So when it hits 80%, we want it to be blue. If it's below 80%, we want it to be red. We're done with that. And again, we can move this guy around. We can stack it. And then if we wanted to make this um, kind of dependent upon the map view. We can come back into the configuration of the map itself, go to layer actions, we'll add, a la um, add an action, and we'll add a filter action, and our target's going to be both of these for our gauge. So now depending on what I zoom into, my gauge should change. Sometimes this doesn't work live so well in the builder. Um, but when I'm finished, I just save this. And then I can share this out. Um, and then anyone who needs access to this, whether it's a group or my entire organization or even the public could have access to these, would then have access to this as well. So that's kind of the basics of configuring the operations dashboard. A lot more we could go into there. Um, so with that, um, I'm actually finished. Um, I do want to give you our contact information. I'm going to look and see if we have any questions that came up. Uh, give me just a second here. I got a lot of screens open. So let's see, how do we get to the chat? Chat. Oh, nobody's chatted. Either, oh wait, here's one. I don't know if I put you guys to sleep or if I just did an awesome job. Um, can we batch create assignments in Workforce? Let's say I have 100 bus stops to sign and someone, uh, do I need to manually select or can I run a query with the 100 stop IDs? That's a good question. Uh, I came from quarantine. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know that you can do that. Um, I would have to look into that a little bit more. As far as as far as I know, the only way you can really do that batch is do the selection that I did. So you could draw, draw the box to select the stops, but if you had like a list of stop IDs, let me follow up with you on that one. Not exactly sure. Um, see, so we have a question here from Susan. Can we use Collector with Spike integrated? Uh, Collector this time does not have um, the Spike integration. So Spike, Hold on just a second. Um, you guys see me on video? I'm not even sure. So Spike is a device um, that you can connect to your mobile device. And what it does is you can take photos and it uses laser to um, kind of do measurements. So um, instead of actually getting out and physically measuring, you could use a device and just draw on a photo and it comes up with the measurements for the dimensions. So um, right now that works with Survey123. Um, in the future, it might work with the Collector Aurora. So that's kind of the next phase of Collector and Collector's a, a, another field data collection app that we have. But for now, it's just Survey123 for that. And Sam says I did a great job putting you to sleep, so I hope you enjoyed your mid-afternoon nap. Um, can we export survey results from Survey123 as raw, raw data in what format? So yeah, the answer to that is yes. That's just getting stored as what we call a feature layer. And from a feature layer, you can bring that into any one of the ArcGIS apps. So you can bring it into ArcMap, ArcGIS Pro, any of the mobile apps, um, but then you can export that out as a um, 
file geodatabase with feature classes or as a, as a table. So however you wanna get that information, you could always export that out. And then let's see, Ben says, is a traditional user needs assessment among our users the best way to start design or should we create a straw man app and let users tweak it? Um, I think, I don't know, I, I posed that one to the group. I don't know if there's any uh, thoughts on that. If anyone wants to chime in, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, this is just open discussion. So uh, feel free to talk or use the chat window. Um, I, I don't know that I necessarily have any um, insight to that question. Um, I mean, I think I, either way is probably viable. Um, and certainly Esri can help with the user needs assessment as well. Uh, we, that's kind of what my role as a solution engineer is to kind of see what it is you're trying to do and how our solutions fit in there. Um, Susan, how do you show the picture with measurement? So I assume you're referring to Spike. Um, so for Spike, um, you have to have the Spike unit first of all and Spike installed and I don't think I do on mine at this time or else I would show you. Um, but whenever you're creating a survey, so if we did a new survey, where I would start is I would go to, I believe it's in samples, let's look. And we have a spike. Yeah, here it is, spike. So um, use this guy here and create a survey from this. And this has some kind of default questions in here for integrating. Um, so you can add other questions to this, but this has the spike questions. So whenever you, if you were to publish a survey and use it, it would launch spike and it would measure distance, it would measure area, it would measure dimensions, lat long. Um, I don't have the spike app downloaded on my device or else I would show it, but this is where you should start. Um, let's see, dashboard indicators change based on zoom level. Can it change based on a selected geometry, i.e. a county? Um, I don't think that functionality is there yet. Um, again, though, I would want to follow up with you because I know that's something that's been requested and I'm just not sure if that's been integrated or if it's coming in the future. Um, I apologize, I don't know off the top of my head for that one. Emma asks, uh, does the survey have to be created in Survey123? Can it be done with another online survey creator like SurveyMonkey? Um, to, to use the Survey123 app, you're gonna have to use either Survey123 Connect or the Survey123 web app to do that. Um, SurveyMonkey, um, there's probably a way to take data from that and convert it into some type of a GIS format, um, but uh, that would take some, probably some finagling to get that to work. Susan, my question was the picture you showed in the presentation. Um, let's see, I'm not, can you be more specific, Susan? I'm not exactly sure what, um, what picture you're referring to. Are you referring to, let's see if I can pull it up. So survey one, two, three. Stop my, oh, okay, I think I know what you're talking about. Let's, let me just verify. So go to the stop survey, collect data, and this one, Susan, is this it? Okay, um, so yeah, to include photos in your survey, that's pretty simple. So let's go back, look at our survey here. Oh, it's the spike one, close that. Go back to survey one, two, three, connect. I'll just show you how you can include photos or really any media in your survey. Um, so if we look at, our bus stop survey. Yeah, this is the wrong one. Um, so I've been doing name things, exact same name. Let's try this one. It's this one. Okay, so let's 
open that form. So that's just a, let's see here, calculate. Just did this yesterday. So that goes under the media field here. So what I'm doing is I'm making a call to a photo and I just put that in, let's see, where did I put that? So for that question, the select one about the dimensions of the pad, I included media. Now, where does that media go? Let's go back here. So we're in survey one, two, three, connect. There's this open content folder. This opens, these are all of the files that get created to create this survey. In this media folder, that's where you put any photos that you need to be in your survey. The name of it's ADA diagram. So all I'm doing is making a call to ADA diagram.png. I just tell it the name of the file, it includes it. Um, this is CSV file. This is the list of bus stops, stop name, direction, and location that I'm pulling to fill out that first section. So, that, so all of that kind of information goes in the media folder. Does that clarify? Any other questions? If not, um, I want to thank you all for your time. Um, I hope this was useful. If you have any feedback for me, let me know. Um, was this useful to you? Um, are, are there other topics you would like to see in the future? Like I said, we'd like to do these probably around every three months, uh, roughly quarterly. Um, so, and yeah, and the idea here is to not just show a demo, but actually show you how you can dig in and start to, to use this. So. Uh, we've been recording this. I'll be sure to get the recording up, and I'll send that information out. And then, like I said, any supporting documentation I can provide so that you can kind of really dive in, especially the Survey123 stuff. It's really cool stuff, but um, a lot going on there. I mean, just looking at the spreadsheet here, you can see they, they put a lot of work into this. So um, thanks again for your time. Um, everybody have a great and productive week, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Mm -hmm.